and welcome back to Pathfinders, a podcast series where we look at what's new and what's next in the fast-paced world of biotech and healthcare. I'm your host, Joe Coletti. We recently hosted a panel discussion on unlocking biotech's potential, exploring how public and private investment dynamics are driving activity and innovation across the biotech sector. In the conversation you'll hear today, Noel Brown, head of U.S. Biotechnology Investment Banking at RBC, speaks with venture capital leaders Sereni Akaraju of Samstara Biocapital and Craig Gordon of Gordon MD Global Investments. Now, let's dive into the conversation. Hi, everyone. I'm Noel Brown, Managing Director and Head of U.S. Biotechnology Investment Banking here at RBC Capital Markets. I appreciate you all for joining today, and I'm excited to kick off this discussion. So how about we just dive in and uh, talk a little bit about the markets generally? And I would say despite sharp volatility in uh, biotech public markets over the past few years, the XBI has shown some solid performance just uh, year to date and uh, over a one-year basis. Uh, public investors have demonstrated an increased appetite for funding emerging uh, companies, evidenced by recent deal activity across the sector. We continue to see mega rounds in the private market, suggesting that there is ample private capital for companies that are focused on what is in vogue, like INI, immunology, inflammation, cardiometabolic, CNS, among others. Um, all this said, I can't seem to shake this nagging feeling that we aren't out of the woods yet in biotech. And uh, today's market's somewhat comparable to the downturn of 2009 to 14, which was kicked off, obviously, by the financial collapse. Um, Whereas this downturn was ignited by the bursting of the COVID bubble and call it like 2022. And so I think one of the big questions that's out there is, you know, are we safely in our analog of the 2016, 2017 era, or are we still in the analog of 2013, 2014? And so if you can share with us just some of your thinking on that and also touch on say the psychology of decision-making, what is shaping investment choices today, and how these are impacting markets, um, that would be great. And so as you reflect on the current market, how is uh, investor sentiment influencing market outcomes? And uh, how do you think things will look over the next three to five years? Srini, you take it away first. Look, you know, to step back, right, we went through a very long, as you mentioned, down cycle. You know, I'm not great at comparing it to previous cycles, but I, but I do feel like my perspective has been, you know, I've been an investor for 23 years that this is, you know, this is a longer and deeper cycle than we've experienced, uh, at least for most of them. We have experienced in biotech, I think, un unfortunately, for a long period of time where people are afraid to put money to work. Um, I think that's been the, the characteristic, sitting on their hands, not really knowing what the bottom is going to be, not really feeling uncomfortable that if we put money, if I put money to work here, all I'm going to do is lose value in that capital. I don't know when I'm going to put money to work. It's going to actually have a chance of making money. I do I do think, you know, lastly, I think to, to the crux of your question, I think we are coming out of it. I don't think it's a completely dysfunctional market. It's very clear positive clinical data on the public side is rewarded. There's no doubt about that. It has to be very clear positive data. Mixed data is not rewarded. The opposite happens. Negative data, obviously, you get crushed. But, it, but, but all that said to say that it's not totally dysfunctional. There is some rationality to it at least on things that are very clearly positive and companies that have a drug that will be an important therapy. And that is causing investors to finally start to feel like, okay, I need to come off the sidelines. So that's a big pot of money that I've been sitting on and, and you know, hoping to lay an egg here with this thing, but or, or the egg will hatch. Finally, it's let's actually participate in this market instead of being a voyeur. Yeah, so I, I, I share a lot of the same sentiments. I think, you know, in 2019 through 21, you saw a tremendous number of companies go public. They went public at the wrong valuations uh, and way too early. And then you pile on top of that COVID and it created uh, an unparalleled bubble in the space that was bound to burst at some point. It is also not surprising to me that it's taken longer uh, to get out than what people thought. And I think it's really multifactorial, right? One is macro, as you mentioned about interest rates. Uh, one is there's always there there seems to be this perpetual view while well, there's too many companies with a negative EV so of course these are going to do better and and I think that's fundamentally flawed 
Uh, there's also this view that, you know, big pharma is going to come to rescue with their cash flows, and that hasn't really happened in a meaningfully new way. And you also saw for the last couple of years, although it appears to be more stable, a very tough FD environment that had a very risk off view about things. You blend all that together and you get a protracted recovery, along with what I would argue in the private and public ecosystem remains in many aspects inflated valuations versus what we would have seen historically um, a decade ago um, or more. So um, it's not surprising. I still think there's both the private and public ecosystem have, have work to be done there. Having said that, 100% agree, clear innovation is rewarded. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I think, you know, in 2019 through 21, um, some people might joke and say, you could just throw a dart at the IPO and you're going to make money. And that's not historically the way biotech used to be. And I think we're, it's a blast in the past. It is about active stock selection. Um, and, and that's crucial. And it's got to go back to rolling up your sleeves and doing fundamental work, looking for real innovation that, as Srini pointed out, is, is clean. Um, with management teams who are not only competent to navigate the complexities of R&D, the complexities of FDA from both a regulatory and manufacturing perspective, and then if, you're, if, if it's relevant, the complexities of commercialization, which are getting ever so more uh, problematic and, and difficult, especially with the IRA law. So um, it's, it's hard work. And so, um, and I think that's what it comes to. On the flip side, I, I would also add to things, in addition to private rounds where there is capital for innovation, um, I would say two things that. One, I would say you are seeing new bubbles to be created in the private ecosystem, which I think are somewhat concerning that capital is chasing. On the flip side, I would argue that, well, at least what we see both in the public and private universe is innovation outside the U.S., uh, all, you know, in different regions of the world. And I think it's early days for investors recognizing that. And yet it's, it's, it's very clear that that is the case. And I think that makes for exciting market inefficiencies uh, while you're waiting for, I would say, the U.S. to still recalibrate in some, in some instances. Great, all, all that for sure. And especially, you know, um, in these markets, you know, we always have to go back to fundamentals. But despite that, we also end up being a sucker for some of the momentum stuff. And the market itself, is constantly doing this. I mean, look at the pipe of Palooza that we had at the beginning of this year. Unprecedented number of, you know, quick hit pipes. And it was pretty crazy, right? I mean, you've had unprecedented pipe activity in Q1 and into Q2, and people were tripping over themselves to make sure that they were being wall crossed um, because they thought this was going to be the way to generate alpha for the year. And lo and behold, you now fast forward to the end of September, and if you put a dollar in every pipe, you're at, you're underwater. Um, only a fraction of the pipes are now up, and and I think that goes to show you again, fraught with momentum. Near term, it can work, but you give it time, and like anything else, um, it could be quite painful. The majority of the pipes, at least that we were wall crossed, I don't want to speak for Srini, were were not actually based on new fundamental innovative information. It was. Mm -hmm momentum in the space therapeutic area that they were caught up in momentum with the broader markets um um maybe very small patient numbers of data that were questionable at best or exciting preclinical data or writing off of a competitor news flow and saying well we're in that space too yeah uh, you know i think you know, if you're you know you mentioned a few months of diligence we we have we do that that's what we principally want to do on the public side you know, I mean, it's it's too early to to say how how that would work. They all will work out because those are really making um, uh, you know making bets on data two three years hence. I mean, one of them, quite frankly, was Scholar Rock that we led the pipe two and a half years ago. That worked out extremely well because the data was positive. It was announced a few weeks ago, and then we have a few others that that'll take a, another year to three for that data to come out. Yeah, regrettably, in some of those instances where there was data that was meaningful. Uh, that was sort of put out into the market, either by pipe or through public press release. Many of those didn't see like the performance in the aftermarket. Oftentimes, I think because, you know, as we talked about, this investor time horizon has shifted dramatically. Like the, the, the venture and venture capital and the kind of like the risk profile that I'm used to seeing among uh, public investors focused on this space has like been truncated I mean, dramatically. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it depends what you're built to do, right? And so if you're built for a flip, then that's obviously very problematic. I mean, we're long-term fundamental investors. So I guess that makes me a dinosaur of three to five years. 
right? So if I'm doing, whether it's an IPO, a pipe, or, or uh, just a public investment in general, um, we have a multi-year view. And so we're patient for that, right? But you're right that in many regards, investors were using pipes as a way to generate immediate near-term alpha. And I think too, frankly, it's just, it is hard to make money in biotech. Historically, that's the way it's been, right? But yeah, I mean, you think about the interest rate headwinds, the, the M&A headwinds, the FDA headwinds, you know, the competitive landscape where there's greater and greater risk of leapfrogging two drugs launching near simultaneously instead of two years separated. And it makes it much more challenging. So when I look at the market and I see some of the I don't want to call them trends because it sort of takes away from the fact that there's been genuine innovation. Like, you know, in the case of uh, Glip ones I mean, I, I do think that's going to unlock opportunities that are, frankly, almost unfathomable to us today, right? I mean, it really is has the potential to kind of change health span, longevity, broader human health, right? Where we're only just kind of in the early innings, I believe. But I would say, while this has been exciting of late, it's not like, you know, Glip one receptor agonists are brand new, right? I mean, we sort of known about this weight loss benefit is going as far back as like 2010s, like early part of that decade. So are we seeing real new innovation? And if so, where are we seeing it? Absolutely. And I think it's broad, in my opinion. There's been such an explosion in the universe that I think that there's a there's a struggle to find the right amount of human capital to execute, especially given the regulatory environment that we exist. But I do b believe that that there is clear innovation. I think it's happening in academic centers early on. I think it's happening in private companies. I think it's happening in the public ecosystem, whether it's small, mid, or large cap. And I think it's happening outside the U.S. in addition to the U.S. Yeah, I mean, just maybe to add briefly to it, there is no doubt the last six, seven years has been the highest quality and quantity of deal flow that I've ever experienced. We are in an unbelievable innovation cycle right now. That cycle is long. I mean, I think it's not a you know, another few years and then we'll, we'll slow down. I think quite frankly, it'll keep, it'll keep picking up probably 20 or 30 years. And there's little doubt in my mind that biotech will be the source of multiple really important new therapies that have a absolutely transformative effect on a lot of patients' lives. And that will also come with obviously a lot of value creation. So, you know, epigenetic modulation is one example, right? Did we really think that this was going to be a viable therapy 10 years ago? Probably not. And certainly it's clear that it will be. There's clearly a lot more work that needs to be done to get to that. But we will have multiple drugs in that category that will be important therapies. Mitochondrial biology, another one that's on the biology side of where we're starting to understand things. So, you know, I, again, I think, I think it, we're fortunate to be in this business at this moment in time. And that moment will continue for the next multiple decades. So there's, there's a lot of wood to chop for a lot of years. It sounds like we're entering the next phase of like the biologist, right? Like the biologist is getting their due, their just due, because I think there is a lot of other advancements and other parts of medicine and research that we kind of, I don't know, I didn't feel like biology was getting its fair uh, spotlight. So we're definitely seeing that of late. What I think is the opportunity in our industry to imagine that you could take the leading cause of blindness in the elderly and make that not so anymore because of a fundamental understanding of some of the biology that we that, that we pursue, and yeah, that led to some winners and some losers, but ultimately the patients were the absolute winners. There's others. Maybe one that's worth mentioning too that we you know we were fortunate to be involved in, um, but it goes into um, surrogate markers, right? So surrogate markers for chronic disease is critical. Uh, validated surrogate markers that are approval endpoints critically important to move that forward. We know, for example, in kidney disease, people are, you know, there's, there's now multiple articles, multiple companies in renal that wouldn't have been reasonable to, to fund five years ago, certainly 10 years ago. And it's all because the FDA ultimately said, you know, this, you know, proteinuria as an endpoint is something that we're willing to give approval on as long as you come back with, you know, three, four years of data on, on those patients to see what the slope of EGFR is. So that kind of continued innovation um, for for validate surrogate markers uh, for chronic diseases, it will continue to be incredibly important. We get, we have a lot more work to do there for a lot of different chronic diseases, but that but that's one example. Honestly, you know, cholesterol levels and statins is the the, the the first example with Framingham, right? But we need more of that. I'm sure we will get more of that, um, and that'll also lead to really important new therapies for chronic and, diseases. And but, what's important, just to piggyback yeah. on on that example, is 
is even if you're using surrogate, the innovation can still be big. I mean, think about the drugs, for example, Eigen, which I'm sure was partially what he was thinking about, um, and the breakneck pace of innovation we've seen that has real impact, right? And, you know, hopefully we're on the cusp of having the first biologic approved by Otsuka, who announced yesterday that their drug worked in Eigen. And, um, and this is a perfect example where, you know, this is what FDA and industry are supposed to be doing, and we need, to, we need FDA and industry to get back to those roots. How do we move the goalposts in a productive way to promote real innovation that doctors want to prescribe, patients want to take, and, and, and obviously payers want to pay for? And that shifting of mindset yeah. on, say, for example, these endpoints, is that, do you see that, whose responsibility? I mean, is it the companies that are sponsoring trials that need to go to the FDA and have these discussions saying, listen, like in osteoporosis, it's ridiculous that, you know, the endpoint is, you know, breakage, right? It, it should be bone mineral density or something. Is there some other lobby that it's should tough, be? Right. I mean, like I'll pick on your example for postmenopause osteoporosis, right? I mean, you have a bunch of therapies out there and yes, there's still some unmet need, but you know, it's such a big population. You got to worry about safety. Right. And so I applaud, you know, so that is the battle that FDA has to do as a public agency. Right. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, you know, and we've seen this repeatedly over time and when FDA has strong leadership, there's there's real ability to kind of you know take some risk and and uh, and and be comfortable making decisions off of you know not a perfect data set. In other words, perfect not meaning that there's things that are problem with it, but there's things that are missing that's just realistic because otherwise we gotta we gotta follow 100,000 people for 10 years to actually have. And that comes data. back to also companies having the right leadership and the human talent to drive that functioning, strong dialogue with FDA, right, or, around those examples that he gave. I mean, there was such a demand um, during that whole 2020-21 company creation era where, you know, we got kind of thin. I mean, new executives were being created every day, but a lot of these management teams were, you know, three, four years as an executive, right? So this was the worst downturn they'd ever seen. Recognizing that the talent pool has been spread so thin, should we see some consolidation of this, not just because we want to see like complementary technologies being developed in the same pipeline, but do we want to see a concentration of management to actually drive these things over the finish line so we increase our success rate? I think it's, a, I think it's an important point that a lot of what we do on, on private biotech is that we're, we're going to have management teams, CEOs, and team managers that are, that's their first time in those roles. And there is absolutely some risk associated with that. We've thought a lot about how do we help mitigate that a little bit? Um, you know, as investors and board members, our wisdom being part of that is only a tiny fraction of what could possibly be there. What's much more important for us is, you know, we've got at least some sorry, we've got this great pool of venture partners who have 30, 40 years experience, and they really, you know, help with these companies, I think is invaluable. And I think that is something that this industry needs. I mean, just to put another point on it, the reality is, again, going back to we are in this incredible innovation cycle. It is the pace of it is incredible. The quality of it is incredible. And so what that means is we're already well, the, the balance of, you know, how many great opportunities there are to move forward versus experienced people to move them forward is already out of whack. And it's only going to keep spreading. So we have to find solutions to, you know, make sure that we're not making dumb mistakes because those dumb mistakes are 10, 20, $100 million mistakes and, and many, many months or years. So I think, I think it's important for the industry to, to, to pull in really experienced managers to, to, to now really be a part of any of these younger companies. And I would argue that I think it gets even more complex, right? Interest rates were zero and everyone drank the Kool-Aid and believed, you know, if you build something new, it's going to happen and faster and greater probability of success and all these things that did, didn't pan out, right, um, in that regard at a higher level. And I think there's now a, a realization that, you know, it is much tougher to raise. Um, it takes longer. You're going to raise less. You have to watch your budgets. You have to prioritize your pipeline. You have to think about, you know, how to, how to retain and recruit top talent, but at the same time constrain your, your, the employees and all these things. Right. That's why you need, you know, the gray haired people who who used to invest way back when, when all those things weren't happening um, to understand how to kind of reconfigure. So you guys touched on some uh, things I wanted to revisit because I know it's of importance to a lot of the executives, clients of ours, um, 
particularly the emerging biotech side, we are often, the banker is sometimes in the middle with managing how do we help a client strategize for the long run versus engaging with you all to try and get capital. And oftentimes the feedback we get from investors is like, there's too much going on there. They can shut down two of those programs. I don't need you to help me build a portfolio. That's what I do for a living. Just come to me with one program, right? I'm going to fund the one thing. But as a CEO, you're like, okay, well, it's biotech. This one thing may not work. And if it doesn't work, then I have no company. I have a responsibility to this broader pipeline to make sure it continues to move along. So how do how do how should a CEO think about balancing that in today's environment? I almost never invest in a company with one asset, almost never, uh, public or private. I mean, there are exceptions to every rule, of course, and I live them, and there's some in my portfolio today, but it's extraordinarily rare. I think the key is, is how do you prioritize your pipeline? How do you sequence it? How do you think about leveraging potential partnerships to it that, you know, multiple different ways to bring it to internalize value while you may be focusing near term on one asset, you know, to generate value to then pull in additional assets yourself besides the main one. And I, and I agree with what Craig said, prioritization is critically important. You know, there's a fundamental, for private buyers, there's a fundamental rule, right? Keep your eye on the ball. And what's the ball? The ball is you get funded again, right? Full stop, get funded again. And I got it too. I got to as well for my fund, but that's a, that's a different set of, set of questions. But for a company, right, it's really, you know, that, that sort of perspective, that, that, um, that filter, it's not intuitive, but, but that is really, really important. You guys have said incredibly encouraging things, and you guys have been incredibly gracious with your time. Craig, Srini, thank you both so incredibly much. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of Pathfinders and Biopharma, brought to you by RBC Capital Markets. This episode was recorded on October 23rd and was originally broadcast on Endpoints News. If you'd like more information or to continue the conversation, please contact your RBC representative or visit rbccn.com forward slash biopharma. If you're enjoying Pathfinders, don't miss an episode. Subscribe to us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. See you all next time. This content is based on information available at the time it was recorded and is for informational purposes only. It is not an offer to buy or sell or a solicitation, and no recommendations are implied. It is outside the scope of this communication to consider whether it is suitable for you and your financial objectives.